Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to In Conversation with Ben Silverman and Charlie Corwin. Please welcome our moderator, executive editor at Fast Company, Rick Tetzelli. Uh, hello. Um, I'm going to keep the introductions uh, short here because we've got a lot to cover. Um, ben Silverman uh, can be described as uh, many things, uh, a serial entrepreneur, uh, former chairman of NBC, uh, founder and chairman of Electus, and an Emmy and Golden Globe award-winning producer. Um, Charlie Corwin uh, is CEO and founder of Original Media. Uh, he has won awards uh, for film, for scripted television, and for unscripted television. And the thing that we're here to talk about is um, sort of how these two, these two men managed to find one great program after another at a time um, when it's, it's sort of the, the age of flux, as we call it at Fast Company, where everything is up in the air, everything is being disrupted constantly, and um, you know your partners are your former competitors. Um, it's, a, it's a really uh, crazy time. I wanted to give you a list of um, the kind of folks these guys work with, just to give you a sense of the, the range of opportunities they're able to find. Um, they have worked with, uh, or are working with, um, The Rock, tattoo artists, Jessica Simpson, Sofia Vergara, Dog the Bounty Hunters, Nerd, Dave Navarro, Kevin Smith, Rachel Zoe, Matt Din Dillon, and the screenwriter Akiva Goldman. So uh, they have uh, pretty much covered all of it. And as I was driving over here, I, I, it occurred to me that um, you know we could we could drive down uh, we could drive out here, go five blocks, and they'd find five different stories they'd be uh, <laughs> ready to pitch and create. So I wanted to start off broad. Um, how do you keep finding um, you know, great shows to produce at a time when everything is so topsy-turvy? Well, I think both Charlie and I are you know, culture hounds ourselves and uh, truly are interested in the world. We're good friends as well as collaborators and competitors. And I think that we both, growing up in New York City, walked the streets as kids, lived on the streets growing up, and really were turned on by the humanity around us. And the ability to then kind of express that in storytelling, I don't know what other job we would have done, and neither of us has the discipline to actually do real work like write. So we, <laughs> we, we I think, gravitated towards this kind of storytelling. And uh, you know, you see tremendous, characters and now there's this great platform in in television to bring those characters to a larger audience and uh, and the same goes for tremendous talent whether it's uh, writing talent directing talent or acting talent you know finding the right vehicle making sure that Steve Carell you know can flourish you know, inside an office, he, he may not have flourished inside Anthony's CSI, mm -hmm. you know, and so really also having that kind of ability to match environment to talent as well is something that um, we both are constantly working on and thinking about from a uh, producerial level. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I want to say, first of all, that. Um, you know, Ben has shaped really a lot of my perspective on this industry over the course of our, our friendship as my agent, as my partner, producing partner, my studio, my network. You know, we've done a lot of stuff together and, and, and he is, he's really one of the, one of the great disruptors in the business he's today. He's saying that because my mom is in the second row. Mary Silverman, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Hi, Mary. It's all because of mom. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. Thank yeah, you. we enjoy being disruptive together. Um, 
so yeah, and I, I think I think we'll, you know the simple thing in in this you know like you say topsy turvy sort of cacophony of of disruptive things is is the constant is we look for uh, great ideas and talented people to execute those ideas. I mean I think that it's true that you know despite whatever proliferation of distribution channels or media platforms or you know, new uh, technology that if you make a good program, audiences will find you wherever they find you. Uh, I think that that remains true no matter what. So, you know, they may be, it, it may be in some ways more difficult um, it, to, to have a real tentpole hip because, um, you know, audiences are spread out and they have a lot of choices. But I think in other ways, it's easier to find specific audiences, um, which is something you know, uh, we're able to do. You say matching things up. Um, you know, one of the nice things about all the digital out outlets now, um, cables, everything else, is that it, it, at least a lot of what I do is to identify culturally specific worlds, as you were talking about, and find big hyperbolic characters that epitomize them, try to tell their stories that kind of anthropological approach tends to match up well with the more targeted demographics of those kind of media platforms. So um, it's interesting that you say that, 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 that you can, if you, if you find the right story, you, you will find an audience. Because we were talking backstage about whether, you know, being a producer now, whether you can be just a creative content pr producer or whether you also have to be a creative producer in thinking about business models. Yeah. And you're saying, and is it possible just, you know, to forget about the new business models that you have to deal with? I mean, he can speak better to this than he, I would say the short answer would be, yeah, the, chal the challenging thing now in the way that, it, that the landscape has changed, I think the creative approach in some ways is constant but where you need to be more innovative is in strategic rollouts and figuring out business models that work in today's environment. But I want to let him talk to that more. No, but I mean, we're not in a pro bono business, so it'd be easy to get all, <laughs> all our stories told if we succumb to the oligopoly that controls 99% of the voice that you know reaches all of you and succumb to their desire to consolidate deal models that are totally unfair for any independents and don't really grow opportunity or entrepreneurship. Um, and we could be making stories all day long. But luckily, with proven track record and success, we are able to at least be a stakeholder in that conversation. Right. And I think what's happening is the same level of innovation and creativity that needs to be spent on developing and building the show now needs to be spent alongside it in building and developing a business model that can lead to profitability and can lead to a situation where both your partner on the media distribution side and you on the supplier side can both flourish. Right. And it just requires no. pieces of the business that you both do well to be shared and then pieces of the business that maybe one of you does better than the other to be divided and shared. And that's something that um, we have at Electus, you know, consistently tried to bring to the table so that we're not just coming with a great idea, we're also coming with maybe a brand partner uh -huh. or an off-channel marketing support network or a distribution strategy outside of the primary window on the network internationally that could be a profit center or let's sell some clothes like in fashion start mm -hmm. you know starting to think about things so not that not just launching shows launching businesses in 360s so, and so let's, adjacencies. let's take two shows two of your shows um, that launched several years ago um, Rachel Zoe project and uh, biggest loser um, so Charlie if you were launching Rachel Zoe project now instead of five years ago what would you do differently uh, well, I mean, a lot. I mean, I think that I, I, um, 
specific to that show, which is a, I guess the subgenre would be like workplace docu-series, that um, especially in those kinds of shows, you are launching a business, not just a television series, and you need to realize the potential to, um, to platform different products and, and integrate different brands within that. And, you know, as the landscape for business models gets more complicated, there's also more opportunity. Since the price points are also lower, as, as you pointed out to me backstage, I think that um, the right way to do these deals is if people are getting less money up front in terms of fees or, 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 or you know, just production dollars uh, to make shows, that they should participate in the upside and success, that there should be real profit participation, real partnerships in these shows. That was something I didn't do as well as I should have on that show. Uh-huh. And what would you do different with Biggest Loser? You know, I, luckily at the time that Biggest Loser launched, which was longer ago than when Rachel Zoe right. launched, people, there wasn't Facebook, there, wa there wasn't yet a sophistication around all of the opportunity that show brands could build as mm -hmm. off-channel brands. So I was able to have real strong, transparent dialogues with our network partner in the window they controlled, which was the United States, about monetization opportunities. But it was a big process. And so some specific examples around it was that no one believed at uh, NBC Universal, at NBC at the time, that we could make any money from subscription uh, web businesses, that that was something that no one would do and no one would care to do. And I was able to let M get NBC to grant us those rights on their behalf mm -hmm. as the chief uh, financial partner in it to bring in another partner to fund it because they didn't believe in it. And we brought in Rodale, to the publishing company, to right. come in and be our partner. And that became more profitable for NBC and us than the show outside of the ad time sold on right. the network. And today, they would never have let us bring in a third party partner. They would have funded it on their own and, and or said still that it can't make money. Hello, Netflix, it can make some money. And then, um, and then on the other side, um, the home video division at the time at Universal said that they didn't believe in fitness videos. And they didn't think that that category post Jane Fonda was a value. And so once again, on their behalf, we got granted those rights as a entrepreneurial partner. And we went to Lionsgate to do our home video, right. and those videos became the top selling fitness videos of the past 10 years. So, so that kind of thinking went into the show right from the beginning. We, we were aware it had a business opportunity, but at that moment, there wasn't kind of the I want to own everything mentality that there is today. Uh -huh. um, and so the, the, now, if I was doing that, I would come in with partners in place for those elements of the business and do that work beforehand right. so that I could ensure that opportunity could still happen knowing that there'd be inherent resistance. Right. Also, like, they're, you know, they're, they're very different shows in the sense that like, you know, Biggest Loser is um, a network show, it has a broader audience, and it's a competition format. Um, and, and, and so the format was the thing. I think it lends itself better to the kinds of business models that Ben is so great at creating. What's more difficult about uh, personality-driven uh, docu-series is that they, um, there's a lot of talent management involved and, and you end up in this sort of weird love triangle between the talent, the network, and the producer is expected to really somehow you know, sell through these issues, the, you know, the, the talent is very smart now. In the world of, 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 you know, skinny girl margarita, people have gone pretty smart. Right. And, and, and when I say people, I mean both the networks who, you know, for instance, Discovery famously was burned on the, on the OCC American Chopper deal where, where they didn't have a piece of that mm -hmm. merchandise and it made a lot of money. Um, you know, and also on the talent side where they, they, these people know, they're like, you know, 
I, I'm going to have cameras following me around and there's a certain part of my life that I'm going to give up in order to do that. And the reason I'm going to do it is not for my you know, relatively small per episode talent fee. The reason is so that I can launch a giant brand or product inside of this show. Right. And then you fight over how that gets carved up and what the focus of the creative is. Does it become a commercial that's basically platforming the product inside the show? Or is it real entertainment for the, for, for the audience in the way that the network and the advertisers want? Right. Those are hard things to negotiate. Right. And, and that's at the cable, you're talking at the, at the cable level. Yeah. There. And at the network level, what are the, what are the big things that you're worrying about when you, when you go in? Is it, this, is, is it having all your partnerships lined up when you go in with the show? Yes, we're trying to do that more and more around properties that we develop so that we can have a meaningful conversation with a third party stakeholder who is an expert in the arena that we want to explore in uh, conjunction with our network partner. And then on the other side, it's just how the physical episodes are going to be um, exploited with a um, mutual um, fiduciary responsibility to each other that there should be a financial in connection to, to that exploitation. And many times now, because the companies are so um, multi-tiered and multi-layered, a lot of those show exploitation uh, scenarios are running through their own system uh -huh. within the window that we've granted as a license and there's not the same ability to get the financial remuneration from right. the exploitation if they were oh, oh, 20 years ago just airing on the network and then available to be exploited outside of the window in other marketplaces. I understand why the networks have done that because the repeats themselves on the network aren't as valuable as they once right. were. They have such a diminished rating return that they have to find new revenue streams to right. continue to justify their investment. So I'm a willing partner in that process, but it is one that requires then new thinking about where, where upside will be and where value can be created ar around the content. And then on the other side, I think both Charlie and I really like to tell stories. And so we are people who get leveraged because of our passion, because we want to tell the story. And so there is the moment where both of us will be like, I give up, I just want to make it. You know, and, and so, and we don't, we, we both are similar I in that way. I give up first. <laughs> he gives up quicker. But, um, but, you know, we're both similar in that sense that if we want to tell the story, you know, uh -huh. we're, we're, there, there's, there's the moment, you know, getting the story to reach an audience is the biggest turn on for us more than right. than other elements of right. it. Yeah, and and, pre and you know the presentation does affect the content. I mean, I try not to. We bo I think we both try not to reverse architect from a business model because it's probably not the best way to be creative. You know, you want to just do pure development, start with a great idea or a great piece of talent, and go from there. But you know, there's a great parallel I was just thinking about in in the in the music business. W you know, with one of the probably biggest disrupting gadgets ever, the, the iPod and iTunes and the interoperability between those two things, you know, that did change the way that we presented content in that, you know, sing the single became more important, the album faded away, music videos went viral. Those things did change, but the music itself, I think, were people just creating music. I don't think they started from that thing. The parallel, like right. I say in television, right. is, you know, as Cable does these things that you were talking about in terms of business models, and they say, you know, or or you know, premium goes up, retransmission fees fees get higher, people go elsewhere, and you 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 launch a, 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 an audience base of cord cutters and time shifters, and now you have to be aware of how you present content because it's being consumed differently. Uh huh. You know, it's interesting because you you're talking about the music, you're talking about. You know, there's, there have always been musicians who created songs, right? Mm -hmm. And you, um, you've done a lot of work in reality mm -hmm. television. Now, there was not a history of people wanting to sort of just broadcast themselves or their experience. So, so 
in a way, the, the, the producer of the reality show is really the creative <laughs> impetus of, of that show, right? Where, does, where do you think, um, are, there, are there all kinds of n new opportunities out there with reality that we haven't seen so far? I know you, you guys started loud um, on YouTube. Are there are there are there places we're going to see reality go in the next couple of years that that is, are very different from what we're seeing now? Yeah, I mean, it is a lower cost production model, so there's a reason that Discovery built up its business on it, and History built up its business on it, and Nat Geo built up right. its business on it, and those cable players invested heavily in it because it was a way into original programming without mm -hmm. having to pay $3 million an hour, you could pay $350,000 an hour. And that was a good business right. model for somebody on a second, third tier trying to compete but still offer something original. And I think you're seeing that big time on the digital platforms in a similar way, that they are being investors in that kind of content initially because it's easier than going and green lighting a $100 million movie as your first move into original uh, production storytelling. But on the other side too, you know, having just left Sundance last week, to me, the coexistence of what's happening in the documentary film world with what's gone on in the reality television storytelling world is, is fascinating and is also, you're seeing people like Morgan Spurlock who tra travel across both worlds, Alex yeah. Gibney who travels across both worlds, RJ Cutler, who travels across both worlds, you know, Charlie and I, who, who travel across both worlds making th those kind of films. And to me, it's the most interesting storytelling right now is that kind of storytelling. Right. You know, it, that and the great serialized dramas are the two kind of things that I'm most excited about in my viewing mm -hmm. queue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I agree. I think it's. I mean, the short answer is yes. I think we're all, there's always going to be innovation and there's always going to be um, emerging and changing um, audience tastes, right? And I, what I think is interesting is how much, and, and you were speaking to this just now, uh, how much these different um, platforms or genres impact one another. I, I mean, I think mm -hmm. that in, in, in a lot of ways, the advent of user-generated content has baked into it a sort of flavor of authenticity that audiences really enjoy. And then that has made its way into filmmaking. I mean, I think right. that things like Blair Witch or Paranormal Activity or even like The Hurt Locker, they have styles that feel more, you know. Modern family. Yeah, the office. Right. exactly, exactly. Thank you for yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it really, it's born of, of that world. So they do impact each other. And that's just the evolution of taste and people responding to that. In cable right now, everybody's into reality comedies. That's like a thing. It's you know probably because of Duck Dynasty or Honey Boo Boo, but you know uh, or the Newlyweds or the Newlyweds, right? <laughs> right. right. Um, I have one more question, and then we will open it up uh, uh, to questions from the audience. Um, do you um, do you are the the in the in the new world you guys are playing in? Um, you know, you two have competed, you've worked together. Um, do, you think that, do you think that everybody has adjusted to this, the fact that we are now in a world where your best idea, your next uh, great partner could come from absolutely anywhere? It could come from an advertiser, it could come from, uh, you know, the guy down the street who runs a shop, it could come from somebody you've known for 40 years. Yeah, I, 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 you know, absolutely yes. I think that the, this is a great time for entrepreneurial producers, and like Ben and like me, it's it, you know, it's I get to do like I could be developing. I am developing, you know, uh, a premium cable historically based mini scripted miniseries, uh, reality ensemble cast docu soap, a genre horror feature film, and a digital, you know, brand integrated series. Like all at the same uh. time. It can come from anywhere. And I think what you want to do and what we've always done, I think, is to sort of look at things with soft eyes and say, there's something, there's some, there's a seed, there's a 
a spark. What does it want to grow up and be? And let's not be platform specific, let's not be territory specific, and let's, let's find great partners and, and, and make something innovative. Yeah. yeah, we're constantly looking for great ideas and great stories to tell and, and great you know, people to showcase. And you have to be open. I mean, you know, personally having built a career out of traveling around the world looking for ideas. And, you know, I see my partner Luis Balagua there and we've just um, set up a big show at ABC based on a South American format, you know, uh -huh. today that, that we found that was an anthology, but we saw something in it that was incredible. It's called Killer Women. And we, uh, we're able to adapt it with great partners like Mar the director Martin Campbell and writer Hannah Shakespeare and turn it into something that ABC just green lit. And you know, you have to be looking. There's no rock right. you can't look under. And I, you know, having traveled so often, one of the first things I do when I get in the taxi cab in Holland or London or um, wherever is ask them what they're watching, you know, uh -huh. what, what's uh -huh. turned on. So it can come from another market, you know, but it also can come from you know, a vibe or an energy that you see. We both spend a lot of time fascinated with the art world, and we're both trying to crack that together because we know where art is meeting uh, commercialization and what's happening in and around it. That uh -huh. It's yet to be done right on TV. It's yet to be tapped into. So we look at things like that from a cultural perspective constantly, and That's then great. you try and find who are the characters in it, Where's the story? You know, what, what doesn't feel like homework? Because that's inherently what people think about art. How do we make it about performance art? What's right. Banksy? He's different than Picasso. What, you know, all of these questions. And we debate it and think about it and <coughs> shape it and form it until hopefully there's a buyer in the yeah. room who wants that's it. That's great. Yeah. I think we've all, all, you know, we have always obviously all been curious about one another and people that are different than us. And, and, uh, you know, to, to this day, I, I, I sit in my windowsill in New York and watch people walk around the street and try to imagine where they're going, where they were coming from, what's their story. And, and that, I think, you know, I, I've told stories about uh, tattoo artists, alligator hunters, storm chasers, celebrity stylists, fanboys. I mean, it goes on and on. I think, you know, we will always continue to look for, for, for new stories and new people right. in that way. Right. Do we have any questions from the audience? Mm, okay. Um, does can you tell me a little bit about Loud and how that's yes. how that's going and how reality is playing online? Absolutely. So in our uh, we have a partnership with Google. Um, we have three channels on YouTube that uh, they financed, as well as College Humor, which is one of the top ten. YouTube channels, um, but is its own destination right. separately. And we've learned a tremendous amount uh, through this process with YouTube around Loud and Nuevan and Hungry. And one of the first shows we put up on Loud was called K-Town, mm -hmm. uh, set around a really fun group of friends in Koreatown in Los Angeles. And we were debating how long to make the episodes. And our initial thinking was they should be between kind of five and eight minutes. And so we put something up that was 11 minutes. It was a little long. We were nervous. And the first reaction back from the audience was, I wish it was longer. So then the next time, we went to 14 minutes, and we lengthened out. And then we started to notice people would binge view and watch them all at once. And so they were actually watching <laughs> an hour and a half of all the K-Towns that were up and available to consume. We've just launched season two, and now we're doing them at 22 minutes, you know, the typical length of, oh, a, really? of a network show and seeing great consumption. So I think that's been an incredibly interesting evolution as we see if you deliver high-end episodic content, it is being consumed even if it's on tablet, laptop, or over the top through a TV in the same manner that they're uh -huh. consuming the office, right. you know, and that, that was an incredible uh, learning curve, but I think the other big learning curve we had in our partnership with them is really how young that audience is. How, you know, we are in a kind of divided world demographically right. around age between uh, a, a 25 and under and a 25 and over. And would you expect that K-Town audience to 
follow the show to cable if it made that leap? Yeah, I can't imagine and why a cable channel wouldn't look at these numbers and go, wait, I want all those people to watch the show on my air in the same way. And we're launching a, a big show with Eminem as our partner called Detroit Rubber, set in a sneaker store in Detroit. And that feels like one of the shows that Charlie or, or I would have likely gone into the cable networks to pitch, but actually we're starting it on loud and launching on loud because we think it's a great environment because we can play around a lot of the M&M's audience, right. the people who love sneaker culture's audience, people who are fascinated with Detroit, the people who like these guys who are big characters. So, you know, it's been a really great process and, you know, we're very bullish on the expansion of that relationship. Wow, that's great. That's great. Um, we're out of time. Uh, I want to thank Ben and Charlie very much. Uh, well, thank I really you, enjoyed it. Thank you, buddy.